audiobook, Simply This Moment. 10 Conditioned Reality. Damaloka Buddhist Center. 7th of July 2000. Subjects that often come up in Buddhism are the conditioned and unconditioned. Especially if one is a seeker after the truth, a seeker after reality, a seeker after freedom. People who have studied basic psychology, or have some understanding of the nature of things, know how much we are conditioned by our kama, by our experiences, and by so many different things. Those conditions actually affect the way we see the world and experience reality. They also affect our choices and the way we use our life. When we look very deeply, we can see that our choices condition our lives, but our choices are not free. There are many influences making us do the things that we do. The way we look at things is not as they truly are. Many people have pointed out that we see, we hear, and we experience what we want to experience and what we want to see. This is the reason that our reality differs from the reality of the person sitting next to us. The cycle of delusion. We create and make our own reality, our own world. We live in that world. We condition that world. I spoke very briefly earlier about the Buddhist idea of a god. Especially about creation and whether Buddhists believe in a Big Bang, or in the beginning of things. The person who asked me that question very accurately pointed out that the one thing that we can know is that there is a creator inside of us. We create our world. We might say we condition our world. The way we condition our world is very much due to outside influences. People wish to be free and we talk a lot about freedom in this Western world, but if we look deeper, we find that what we take to be freedom is bound by the chains of conditioning. The goal of Buddhism is to see that conditioning, recognize it and untie those bonds. In Buddhism we have a teaching called the Ten Fetters. Fetter is a very accurate translation of the Pali word Sayajana. Using the ideas of the agrarian society of India 2500 ago, Yojana means the wooden neck piece for coupling a pair of draft oxen. This was how one joined the oxen together to pull a cart. This is a fetter, a binding. The whole idea of Buddhism is to recognize that you are bound and then to untie that binding to achieve a type of freedom that is not recognized in this world, the freedom of the enlightened person. People sometimes think that monks are just attached to rules, attached to being celibate, attached to having few things, and attached to being happy. They don't realize that this is all about freedom from bonds and freedom from conditioning. People don't realize what these conditionings really are. We have blind spots and yet we think that we are free thinkers. We think that we are being rational and scientific. Having worked in science as a theoretical physicist at Cambridge University, I realized even then that many scientists are not free thinkers. They are conditioned. Much of what they do is laden with many, many values, and very often they find what they are looking for, rather than what is really there. I read an article in a newspaper, about a debate on whether science or the scientific method is value-free, in other words, whether it's subjective. The debate was regarding genetically engineered food. The scientists said they were being rational that there is nothing wrong with genetic engineering. Other people were saying that there is a lot wrong with it. Who is right and who is wrong? The scientists said that other people were being completely irrational and were just seeing things through their own belief systems. Because scientists have no belief systems, they see things as they truly are. The argument was settled for many scientists and philosophers. But, who says that science is value-free? There are so many conditionings in science that you see just what you want to see. So much so that there is an old saying in science. The eminence of a great scientist is measured by the 
length of time they obstruct progress in their field. The more famous the scientist and the more prominent they are, the more their views are taken to be gospel truth. That means a great scientist is so great that he or she can't be wrong. So they actually obstruct progress for many years because they must be right and everyone sees it from that standpoint. The Buddha very clearly outlined the whole process of conditioning. He explained that we see the world through tinted glasses. He explained that what we take to be truth, to be real, is far from reality. He called the whole process of conditioning and brainwashing, coming mostly from within us, vipalases. They are the perverted aspect of the whole process of conditioning. They're the reason that what we think we know turns out to be wrong. Have you ever been absolutely sure you were right? And then found out you were wrong? It happens all the time. The vipalases, these perversions of the conditioning process, work in a circle, a cycle of delusion. Our views, what we understand as truth, as reality, influence our perceptions. Basically, our views influence what we choose to see, to hear, and experience. Out of all the different impressions that life offers us there are many things that you could be aware of right now. You could be aware of what I am saying. You could be just aware of what I look like. You could be aware of some fantasies being played out in your mind. Why do you choose to be aware of one thing and not the other? It's because your views guide your choice. If you are angry at someone, or if you have ill will towards them, you will always find something in them to justify that ill will. They say, please, have a nice day today. And you think what on earth do they mean by that? It is the same with paranoia. If someone is really paranoid, they may think a monk is reading their mind. The monk says, no I'm not, and they say, I knew you were going to say that. A psychiatrist told me a few days ago that you can only increase paranoia, you can't decrease it. Whatever you say is looked upon by that person as confirming their view. If you are in love with somebody it doesn't matter what they do or say. If they pick their nose, they pick it in such a charming way. You think, I just love the way you do that. Perception is completely controlled by your views. I'm going to read a story just to show this. This story is called Harvard's Loss. The president of Harvard University made a mistake by prejudging people and it cost him dearly. A lady in a faded gingham dress, gingham is just plain woven striped or checked cotton cloth. And her husband, in a homespun threadbare suit, stepped off the train in Boston, Massachusetts and walked timidly without an appointment into the university. President's outer office. The secretary frowned. She could tell in a moment that such Backwoods country Hicks had no business at Harvard University and probably didn't even deserve to be in Cambridge. We want to see the president the man said softly. He'll be busy all day the secretary snapped. We'll wait, the lady replied. The secretary ignored them for hours hoping that the couple would finally become discouraged and go away, but they didn't. The secretary grew frustrated and finally decided to disturb the president, even though it was a chore she always regretted doing. Maybe if they just see you for a few minutes they'll leave, she told the president of Harvard University. He sighed in exasperation and nodded. Someone of his importance obviously did not have the time to spend with them, but he detested gingham dresses and homespun suits cluttering up his outer office. The president stern-faced with dignity, strutted towards the couple. The lady told him, we had a son who attended Harvard for one year. He loved Harvard and he was happy here but about a year ago he was accidentally killed. So, my husband and I would like to erect a memorial to him, somewhere on the campus. The president wasn't touched, he was shocked. Madam, 
he said gruffly, we can't put up a statue to every person who attended Harvard and died, if we did the place would look like a cemetery. Oh no. The lady explained quickly, we don't want to erect a statue. We thought we would like to give a building to Harvard. The president rolled his eyes. He glanced at the gingham dress and the homespun suit and exclaimed, a building. Do you have any idea how much a building costs? This was many years ago, we have over seven and a half million dollars in plant at Harvard. For a moment the lady was silent. The president was pleased, he could get rid of them now. The lady turned to her husband and said quietly, if that is all it costs to start a university, why don't we just start our own, and her husband nodded. The president's face wilted in confusion and bewilderment. Mr. and Mrs. Leyland Stanford walked away, traveled to Palo Alto, California, where they established a university known as Stanford University that bears their name. It was a memorial to a son that Harvard no longer cared about. Isn't that a lovely story? Just because those two people wore ordinary dress no one realized that they were millionaires and so they started their own university. Isn't that so often the case in life? What we are looking for is what we see. That's the reason the Buddha taught that. Even your bare perception is already conditioned. Even what you hear, or rather, what you choose to hear, what you choose to see, choose to feel has already been filtered by your conditioning, by your attachments, by your desires and cravings. That's why even teaching of Krishnamurti, a sort of silent awareness, or non-doing, was not good enough to find the real truth. What you see and hear is never reliable. That's the reason why sometimes, when I give talks, I give one message, but what you hear may be very different from the message. Something happens to the words that I say before they go into your consciousness. Some things get filtered out. Has it ever happened to you? Have you ever said something and it's been completely misunderstood? You say, I didn't say that, and the other person says, yes you did. You may have said many things, but they've been filtered out or taken out of context. That's where misunderstandings come from. When you begin to understand the way that this cognitive process works, you can understand how we condition even our bare perceptions. From those perceptions we build up our thoughts. This bare knowledge that comes to the mind as you feel, as you see, builds up our thoughts. And those thoughts in turn confirm our views. We have this circle of views bending our perceptions to suit their purpose, and those perceptions, again bending the thoughts to confirm the views. That's the reason we have different ideas, philosophies, and religions in this world. One of those religions is science. Another can be psychology, and others can be humanism, irrationalism, agnosticism, or even Buddhism. These are all different views and ideas in the world. What really concerned me when I was young was where these views and ideas came from. Why do rational people believe in a god who created this world and at the same time created the devil just to tease people? That was very difficult for me to understand. Other points of view, for example, the idea of conditioning shaped by our existing views, thoughts, and perceptions, made it very clear how this was happening. What we receive from the world is basically conditioned by what we expect to receive. In denial. I am going to read a poem now. Listen to this poem. It's about the love for a mother. And everyone knows that that's a wonderful thing. When your mother has grown older and you have grown older. When what was formerly easy and effortless becomes a burden. When her dear loyal eyes do not look out into life as before. When her legs have grown tired and do not want to carry her anymore. Then give her your arm for support, accompany her with gladness and joy. The hour will come, weeping, when you accompany her on her last journey. And if she asks you always answer her, 
And if she asks again speak also. And if she asks another time speak to her not stormily but in gentle peace. And if she cannot understand you will explain everything joyfully. Because the hour will come, the bitter hour, when her mouth will ask no. More. That's a poem that was translated from German, written by a very well-known German called Adolf Hitler in 1923. Did you know that Adolf Hitler was a poet and that he loved his mother very dearly and thought about his love for his mother? No. Well, isn't that because our views are that such a man is so bad and evil that we can never even entertain the idea that he could have a soft emotional loving side? How many of you can make Adolf Hitler's out of your ex-husbands or your ex-wives? Do you understand what I am saying? The conditioning process means that if we think somebody is an enemy then we think they're rotten. We think they're bad. And that's all we see. We can even think, I am rotten, I am bad, I am awful, and that's what we'll see. The conditioning process is so strong that people can sometimes get so depressed with themselves that they commit suicide. Or they can get so full of themselves that they become egocentric and don't listen to anyone else. This is all just conditioning working in these three ways. Don't think that you are free from that. Even now you are not hearing what I am saying but what you want to hear. What you expect to hear. This is the difficulty for human beings, being able to know the truth of things. Another example is rebirth or reincarnation. It's a fascinating subject, not whether it's true or false, but why people believe it's true or false. That's something that has fascinated me for many years. Why is it that when someone has a memory of a rebirth and they clearly remember it, other people often say, no, it cannot be that. 154 way, there has to be some other explanation? Or, why is it that when something happens to you, you believe it has to be due to some event in a previous birth? Why? Are there such strong views on either side? I am especially interested in the reason. People refuse to believe in rebirth. As a scientist, as a rational person, at the very least, you should have an open mind. To me it was something that was quite obvious. Something that I grew up with. My parents weren't Buddhists but rebirth always seemed such an obvious thing to me. I don't know where I got that idea from, but there it was. I found when I came to western countries like Australia, or when I go to see my family in England, that there is a great resistance to the very idea of rebirth. It wasn't that people had open minds, rather they had very closed minds, a locked door to the idea. When I looked deeply, I saw clearly that people had a very strong antagonism to the idea of rebirth. The main reason people are afraid of rebirth is because they don't want to be reborn. They just want to have this life and that's the end. That is one of the reasons people will not even entertain strong hard evidence that they have lived before and that they are going to live again. Whether it's Buddhism, Christianity, or Hinduism, or whatever, rebirth leads to a new life. No matter what religion or belief you have, the next life is always dependent on what you've done in this life. Basically most people are so ill-behaved that they are scared of what's going to happen to them in their next life. They would rather believe that there is not going to be a next life. They are in denial. Where does that denial come from? Again, it's the conditioning and brainwashing, I don't want to believe. It's true. I don't want to see this and therefore I don't see it. Another example is from a disciple of mine. Many years ago she had a very big problem because her husband was sexually abusing her children. He went to jail. She couldn't see what was happening for many months. She was a very loving mother and a very loving wife. As sometimes happens in those terrible situations, it came out at school. 
the teachers saw the signs and when they investigated they found that they had assessed the situation correctly, the children were being abused. The mother felt very guilty, but why was it that she couldn't see those signs? As a Buddhist monk dash, who knows about the mind, knows about conditioning, knows about the psychology of all this, I had to explain to her the reason she could not see what others could see. The situation was so horrendous that subconsciously she didn't want to see it. If you don't want to see something you just cannot see it. It's not a matter of suppression. Which is done openly. It's blocked out at a subconscious level. It happens before this process comes to the mind's consciousness. It's already been filtered out. There was a very interesting experiment done a few years ago at Harvard University. In front of some volunteer students psychologists flashed images on a screen and asked the students to write down what they thought the image represented. The image was flashed so quickly that at first they could not really make out what the image was. Gradually the length of the exposure was increased until they could record some idea of what it was. Then the time on the screen was further increased so that the students could record whether it was what they had expected it to be, until the time the exposure was long enough for them to clearly tell what it was. The findings are illustrated with one example. The actual photograph was of a very well-known part of the campus, a set of steps going up to one of the faculty buildings. There was a bicycle by the side of the steps. One student saw it as a ship at sea, but because the image was flashed so quickly it wasn't much more than a guess. However, once that idea was in his mind, when the length of exposure on the screen was increased incrementally, he still saw it as a ship at sea, again and again. He saw it as a ship when everyone else could see it as a well-known part of the campus. He insisted it was a ship at sea until the exposure was so long that he eventually saw his mistake and corrected it. The lesson from that was that once you form a view it interferes so greatly with your perception that even though the image is right in front of you, you cannot see it. You see it in a different way than it truly is. One of the images that were during the experiment took the students a particularly long time to figure out, it was a picture of two dogs copulating. It was such an obscene or unpleasant thing to see that the students were in complete denial, again and again and again, until it was so obvious that they had to see it for what it was. This is solid evidence for what the Buddha said about the perversions of our cognitive processes. Even though we think we know what our partner is saying to us, even though we think we know who they are, how often we are wrong. This is so not just in relationships with others, but also in our relationship with ourselves, but also in our relationship with ourselves, but also in our relationship with ourselves, but also